as always, if you go out to the P drive for the class, if you want, you can get the folder with today's date on it, which is 01-27-2015. Copy that folder to your virtual desktop and put it into your, under your C colon XAMP HT docs folder. And start up um, XAMP, and then we'll get going in just a minute. Now again, John, John came in and told everybody the other day how to increase, hopefully, the amount of disk space you have, but it's imperative that when you're coming in here, if you are trying to, uh, if you are trying to copy this over and it doesn't work or whatever, you got to let me know as soon as you can, then I will let the people upstairs know as soon as I can. All right, I believe Terry's back this week. He was at some virtual desktop training last week, but I think he's back this week, so. You do or don't have a P drive. I know that's happened with you before. You you may you might want to try doing a, a warm boot, not a cold boot, but just do a restart on it and see if it comes back up. This is our schedule. I modified it, but not really very much. During week one, we did chapters one and two. Last week, we did chapters three and four. This week, we are hopefully going to finish up five and six. Next week, seven and eight. Then the following week, and we'll see how long that takes, because that's that's a that's a change management system or a CMS written in object-oriented PHP. That's chapter nine. Then in week six, we'll finish up chapter nine, complete chapter fourteen, and then for the rest of the semester, you know, I've got here complete remainder of text just in case we need that. But by somewhere around week seven or eight, we are going to be working on a project as a class. And then you're going to, you know, that we'll work on that for a few weeks. And then we are, I'm working on that now. And, um, and then we are going to, uh, I'm going to give you a, a project to work on, and that's what you're going to be doing for the rest of the semester. All right? So, like I said, as far as I know, at least, this is up to date now. All right. And I'm hoping everybody had a chance then to go over and try to uh, copy over the folder with today's date on it over into your C colon XAMP HT docs folder. Yeah, just the CHU05 is fine. All right, so we've gone through Chapter 1, Advanced PHP Techniques, Chapter 2, Web, or Developing Web Applications, Chapter 3, Advanced Database Concepts, Chapter 4, Basic Object-Oriented Programming. So this week we hit more object-oriented stuff. This chapter is Advanced Object-Oriented Programming, and on Thursday it will be more Advanced OOP. Then the next, next week will be Design Patterns and Using Existing Classes, the week after that, it'll be CMS with OOP. And then the only other chapter I plan on covering for the book, I'm going to skip 10, 11, 12, and 13. But I'm going to at least go over a little bit on 14, debugging, testing, and performance. Which is, again, so you have some kind of an idea of what's going on. So, All right, so again, I'm on page 149 in the book talking about advanced OOP. This chapter discusses a few things. Among those, it talks about inheritance. And the good news, if you call it that, I guess, is the way that you inherit in PHP is very similar to the way you inherit in Java. You use the extends keyword. And it's not, although nothing is identical between two languages, it's very simple, or similar, I should say. All right? Um, we'll talk about inheriting constructors and destructors, a little bit about access control where they talk about public, private, and protected, um, using the scope resolution operator, which is a little bit new for this language as opposed to other languages, using static members. And you know what static is. We've already talked about that. All right. So again, last week when I gave the lecture, it took about the first hour. And then the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the period was lab. And my imagine will be somewhere, something like that this period. We'll see. All right. If it means I go straight through till 11 and we get it done, then great. All right. So it says how chapter four introduced the basic terms. You can read them yourselves. All right. This chapter is going to go into inheritance, a little bit on overriding, encapsulation, and visibility. All right. And as it says, inheritance is far and away the most important in advanced object-oriented programming. That's kind of an interesting statement right there because 
There are other books that you can read that say that you shouldn't use inheritance unless you have to because it can lead to very hard to understand code. So it depends on the author that you read. All right? As mentioned, it's where one class is derived from the other. Okay? So in other words, when one class is inherited from another, it inherits all of the parent class's data and methods. Now, how, can, how, how it uses that is going to, to depend on how public-private protected, so the access modifiers, how those are set up. All right. And they show an example right here. And just so you know, too, if you care, this is how you show inheritance also in UML diagrams. So you notice that the child class goes up to the parent class. All right, and the idea is you use an arrow, and the arrow's got a, a tip on the end, but it's open here, just so you know that, okay, in case you ever happen to see that. So by default, if you did nothing, I mean, this wouldn't make a lot of sense if, they, if these were exactly the same, all right? So in other words, if attributes were the same and methods were the same between them, then why would you make a child of that? Of, of that? It wouldn't make any sense. So typically what you do is something like this. So typically in here, you create these attributes and you make them private in here, which means that you can use them in here, but the way that you must use those attributes in the child class is you must use the methods that are defined by the parent in order to be able to use those. So that's why the stuff in here, although it's all available, it's grayed in here to let you know that you're not going to directly be able to do a lot of manipulation. You will indirectly do it. Yes. It depends on what you're doing. In other words, if you look at the example that you have right here, okay, they, you know, if, if, if a language that supports overriding, if you override method one, let's say, so you make your own, your own copy of it, then when you call it, you get that one. But if you want to call the parent method, if you do want it anyway, then you have to say super dot method one. All right? But it depends. You know, typically in a constructor, you'll, you'll call a super first. And it depend, like I said, it depends on the language. Now, for example, with what we're doing this afternoon in Swift, you must always call the parent. You have to. That's just a rule in Swift. Even if the parent does nothing, you must call it anyway. If you don't, it doesn't work. All right. So it's it's language dependent, in other words. All right. Again, off times, the parent class will be called the parent, or the super class. The child class will be called the child subclass, and they go by other names, too. All right, again, it just depends on the book that you read. All right, when you start working with this, you can, you can set up inheritance relationships. So you notice that we've got two child classes that both have the same parent class. All right, this is another language that does not support multiple inheritance. And if you don't know what multiple inheritance is, I'll draw it on the board. So if you're watching the tape, it doesn't help. But it, it's where you have one child has got two parents. All right? So it's as though you did this. You've got class A and class B, and they're both parent classes. And class C, you get that. You can't do that. All right? You can, and about the only language that I know of offhand where you can do that is C++. You can't in Java, you can't in PHP, you can't in C Sharp. They don't support multiple inheritance. Okay. So how do you get around that? We're going to get into that in this chapter and the next chapter. You use interfaces, all right, and we'll talk about some of that stuff. All right. And also, right now, with the classes that they're working with so far in here, all right, this is a regular class. So the parent class is a regular class, as are the child classes, of course. But it's possible to also, if you remember this from your Java days, to create a class and make it abstract, where you can't create an instance of it. So for instance, if this had been pet right here, and this had been dog, and this had been cat, as an example, the parent, the pet class, if that was it, that would probably be an abstract class. Because you can't make it, you can't create an object of type pet because that's too generic in nature. Or if you looked at it where this was a uh, bank account. And then that was checking account and that was savings account. You oftentimes set up relationships like that where you have an abstract class because then you can take all of your attributes and all of your methods that would be used in any of the children, regardless of the type of child it was, and put them in there so they're in a common place.
Now, the key thing when you start working with this, and again, we've talked about this already. You know, I, I've given an example of this. It's not a great one, but it's the one I've used over time, and that is, again, you get two people who have a kid. If both the if both the parents have big noses, there's probably a pretty good chance the kid will have a big nose. That's usually genetically the way it works. Not always, but usually. All right. And again, if the kid has a big nose, what does the kid do? Well, one of two things, right? Either lives with it or gets a nose job. That's really about when you think about it. That's about all they have. It's not like they can take off the nose that they have and and put on somebody else's that they'd rather have. That's kind of what you can do with inheritance, though. All right. So in other words, if I do an override, and the I, the method one in here, I don't like the method one that the parent has. I can do an override and write my own. It has to have the same thing in the parentheses, whatever that happens to be. But it can be implemented totally differently. In the, the, from the child class, if you call method one, it automatically calls the one that's in here. Again, if you want the parent one, and then you've got to do a super dot or whatever, depending on the language that you're using. When you do that, when you override, and the system knows which method to call based on the type of object you have, that's polymorphism. Again, polymorphism is many forms. Usually what most books do to show you polymorphism is they create something that looks more like this, but instead of having it like this and be real simple, they'll have something up here that says shape. And then down here they'll have rectangle, circle, you know, uh, polygon, etc. And they'll have a whole bunch of shapes. And up here they might have a, a method that they create that they call draw. All right, or maybe calculate area. How about that? And the, it, it's an abstract method that doesn't do anything because you calculate the area different for a circle as opposed to a square, as opposed to an you know a polygon, etc. So that's what they're talking about in here. All right. As they say, it's not a good idea for one class to muck around in the in the innards, so to speak, of another, and that's why you have visibility. And just like you saw in Java, there is public that you can use for your classes and your methods and your, your properties or variables. There's private and there's protected, and they pretty much work the same way as what you've learned in other languages, too. So to get into it right here, and let's take a look at what's in here. One thing, remember, that when you work with inheritance, it's an is a relationship. In other words, an admin person is a user. All right. Sometimes that can help if you're not sure which one's the parent. So what we do here is we, d we, d we declare a class called user that where there'd be a username, a user ID, an email, and a password. All right. Th that would be the class data for user. Then there would be a login and a logout. Basically, all the stuff you'd probably equate with a user. All right, an administrator would have those same things, but also would have an access level. Again, I've given you this example before. It's kind of like when I go out to my desktop, I can see drives that you can't see. I don't believe you can see the J drive and the Q drive, etc., because they're they're used for faculty and staff, and there'd be no reason for you to use, to see those. And in the same way, a user can log in and log out as an admin person can do, and an, ad, an administrator or an admin person can also edit a user. Again, that's an is a type of relationship, and that's what they talk about in here. They also mentioned that there is an instance of keyword that you can use. As it says, it can be used to see if a particular object is of a certain class type. I don't know if they go, th go through any examples of that in here or not. Very, it's not used that often. So, class, child, extends, parent. Should look familiar because it's pretty much the same way that we did it in Java. All right. So the first example or set of examples that they'll go through in here is they'll, they say they start with a silly but comprehensible pets example. So they're assuming that you have two pets. All right, you've got a dog and you've got a cat. And both the dog and the cat have a name. Both the dog and the cat eat. Both the dog and the cat sleep. So you define all that common behavior in pet, but the dog can fetch, 
and the cat can climb. So we're assuming here that the cat doesn't fetch and the dog doesn't climb. Does that make sense to everyone? Just because of the way that it's set up. You say, well, yeah, I've got a cat and it fetch. It, that doesn't matter. We're saying in this example, that's the way that we're setting it up. All right. So the author comes in here and creates the commonality first. All right, so it starts to create the class pet. There's just some comments and stuff in here. So all class, cla or I'm sorry, all pets have a name. So again, that's the one thing that we have there. So there's public name. All right. And we set up a constructor where we basically pass in the name for the pet. And you can just say that that particular pet is eating and that particular pet is sleeping. Okay. Now that should make sense to everybody. So it, if, if I've got, and I don't remember the, uh, the names that they used in here, it was uh, Satchel and Bucky. All right, I don't know why, but it's Satchel and Bucky. And Satchel's the dog, and Bucky's the cat. All right, so right here, I'd be setting the name to Satchel or Bucky. Here I'd say Satchel or Bucky is eating, Satchel or Bucky is sleeping. Again, that's the common things. So that's the whole pet class. Then we come through here and we start to extend it. So this is just, right in here, this that you see from lines 43 through 50, that's just the cat class. Since it extends pet, it automatically gets the name, it gets the eat, and it gets the sleep. All right, but it can also climb. Then we've got the dog down here. And again, the dog gets the name, and it gets the eat, and it gets the sleep. But a dog can also fetch. All right, then we create a new dog named Satchel. We create a new cat named Bucky, and we tell them what to do. Now, this should make sense to you is what I'm about to say right now. Notice we can tell the dog or cat to eat or sleep, but if we come in here and we tell the dog to climb or the cat to fetch, we're going to get an error message. That should make sense to everyone because we're attempting to call a method that does not exist for that class. It would be just as if you were working in Java and you were in the string class and you attempted to call a method from the exception class. It wouldn't make any sense to do that. All right, so it's the same kind of an idea. When you're done, this will delete the objects. Just doing an unset. All right, that basically will null out anything that, that it had associated with. So if we run this, all right, again, Satchel is eating, Bucky is eating. Satchel is sleeping, Bucky is sleeping. Satchel is fetching, Bucky is climbing. All right, and you'll see that if I do actually bring it up here, and I, not there, but if I bring it up in here, uh, let's check the client F, and I bring up pets one, that's exactly what we get. All right, so that what that you see right there is the exact same stuff that you see for output here on page 156. Again, he goes through this. I, I just, I've told you this before. I don't want to sit and read what he said. I'll just give you my own interpretation of it. All right? All right. So jumping on. Inheriting constructors and destructors. Again, as it says, there are two methods that are common in many classes, constructors and destructors. The pet class has a constructor, but no need for a destructor. It says, what would happen then if a dog or a cat also had a constructor? By definition, this method is always called underscore underscore construct. How does PHP determine which method of the constructor to execute? All right, so it says, as a general rule, PHP will always call the constructor for the class just instantiated. What does that mean? You're never instantiating a pet. All right? You're never instantiating a pet, so it's going to call the one for the dog or for the cat. And as it says there, the same rule applies for destructors. It says further, unlike some languages, unlike some other object-oriented programming languages, in PHP, when you create an object of a child class, the parent's constructor is not automatically called. All right. 
So the way you'd have to call that, if you wanted to, I believe, is you'd have to say, so if I was a dog and I wanted to call the pets constructor, for some reason I had to do that, I believe I'd have to say, like that. I'd have to call it, and there's no super in this language that I know of, at least. You have to just go out and just actually call it. All right. I think I gave you the right syntax. So the next example they give is a rectangle class that goes back to what they talked about in the last chapter. They're also going to create a square class. As the author says here, all squares are automatically rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. All right. So we'll, they'll create the rectangle class first, and then they will extend it to create the square class. Okay? Now, if we look at the example here, it's interesting because they say, come in here and create this square class, boom. They give you all this stuff, and I'll come back to it in a second. Okay, there's the end of the square class, boom, boom. You do all that stuff. And then they say, call it. It's like, what? They want you to bring in the rectangle class from the previous chapter. They never really tell you that. They say it was created in the previous chapter, but they never tell you to bring it in. Well, I did. All right. So again, what you see in here under the stuff that, uh, that you have in here. So we've looked at pets one already. And here's the rectangle class. And it's the same one. It's the same one that you saw back in chapter four. There's no changes to it whatsoever. But now what we do is we come in and we create the square class, and immediately that class requires the rectangle class, and it extends the rectangle class. All right. So what I, the reason I'm telling you that is if I bring up the rectangle class, well, if, if I run that in here, not in there, in here, and run it, it doesn't show you anything because we haven't instantiated anything, all right? To actually get this to do something, what we have to do is we have to bring on the square class. And in the square class, what it does is it creates first a rectangle that's not a square, then it creates a square, meaning it's also a rectangle, all right? And what's the difference? Well, when you create this, notice the width that and the height that you pass in are different. So you need two parameters, one for width, one for height. For a square, each side is the same, so you only have to pass in one parameter. Okay? So when they extend it, okay, when they extend it, you only need one parameter. And that's exactly what they show in here. So again, I'm doing some stuff in the next chapter already, so. So when we had our rectangle, all right, that constructor needed a width and a height. All right, when we do the square, it only needs a side because the side is the same all, for, all the way around. All right. And that's pretty much what the, he shows you in here. Again, it's important. You must require the rectangle class inside of the square class. The square class must extend the rectangle class. All right. And there really isn't any more, I don't think, to say about it because hopefully at least it's pretty self-explanatory. Again, the syntax for it is a little different because this is PHP syntax. So when I create a new square object, I do it like this. That doesn't really look all that different, but this does. So that's how I call a method from my new object. Dollar sign, variable name, minus sign, greater than sign, then the method call. And when you do this, just so you know, and I think you all do already, you know, there is no, there is no limit 
to the amount of inheritance you can do. You can have a class that inherits a class that inherits a class that inher and you can keep going as long as you need to keep going. When you do that, the idea is you're going from the more general to the more specific. Okay? So if I went from mammal to dog to German shepherd to a certain, you know, let's say there's different kinds of German shepherds, etc., and I would work my way down. Overriding methods, page 161. It says, so far, Ullman has covered how one class can inherit from another. All right. To override a method in PHP, the subclass must define a method with the exact same name and the exact same number of arguments. So if you look at the example that's right here, he explains it pretty well, really. He's got a class that's called some class. And inside of some class, he creates a function that's called scream. And it has one argument. Then he creates another class that extends some class that's called some other class. What great names. All right. And then he overrides scream right there. So he does it differently. The, diff the, the key thing, though, is there is one parameter here and there's one parameter there. Remember, one thing about PHP is the parameters technically aren't even typed. All right, so don't we, it's, what we need here is the name to be the same and the number of parameters to be the same, not so much the type as far as what's in there. So they say here if you call scream the first time, you get eek, 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 and when you call it the second time, you get woo, hoo, woo, hoo, woo, hoo, because it's the different thing that they're throwing out in there. Kind of a weird example, but that's the one he used. So then he comes in and he says, well, let's take a look and let's have pets two here. And pets two looks like pets one, looks a lot like pets one, except now we've come in here and we've added another method, all right, a method called play. And you'll notice it just says so-and-so is playing. Well, why did we do that? Because now you can have one method that handles both climbing and fetching. So in other words, instead of having to, ha to, to go in and write two different new methods inside of dog and cat, you extend the current method that you write in a very generic way inside of pet. And it's not that doing it the first way is right or doing it the second way is right. They're both two different ways of solving the same problem. So which one's better? The answer is, it's up to you. All right. One thing I'm trying to really get across, and you've heard me say this before, but I'm really trying to get across to the first-year people, is there really are. You know, they'll ask me, that, well, I'll show them how to do two things. Well, which one should we use? You should use the one you're more comfortable with. If you work at a job, and at that job, uh, whatever you're working on, if it is real-time sensitive, in other words, if, it's the, if, if the difference between something happening now and a second from now matters, then you're going to have to choose which one of these you use based on which is fastest. Otherwise, if that's not the case, if you're writing a payroll program, you use the one that makes the most sense to you. All right? And that's always a good measuring stick anyway, as far as using the one that makes the most sense. It, it's, there's all sorts of things it might be. I know that when I, when I worked at AT&T, uh, there were certain times I wanted to code a certain way, but they had me, I was being mentored when I started by another guy, and he's, he, he literally was a sergeant in the Army before he retired for like 20 years, so you can imagine how he was. Yeah. And I would said, one day I said, well, I, I think I can do it. He's like, he, he always called me by my last name. Scott, I didn't ask you. I told you we're doing it this way. Why? Because I said so. You know, it's kind of like sometimes you get like that with your kids, you know, because I said so type of an idea, and that's how he was with everything. Yeah. And, you know, the, I, I, when I, I talked to my boss, I didn't, you know, rat him out or anything, but I said, you know, and he's like, no. He said, you're learning from him. That's fine. Just do it the way he says. It'll be much easier than waking, making waves. Okay. So he goes through the same thing here on 162 where he writes the new method called 
play inside of the pet class. Then again, he gets rid of the fetching and the climbing methods, and he changes them to function play in each one. All right? And when you run it, you get the same results. So pets 2 and pets should give me whoops, the same results. So there's pets 1. And there's pets too. All right, he created another uh, animal in here, Rob. But other than that, it's the same stuff that you saw before. I'm not sure why he created another animal in there called Rob. Oh, because he just created a pet. All right, create an unknown type of pet. See, the problem with doing that is now you don't know what Rob is. Right? It's Rob is an instance of pet. In this case, it means Rob must be either a cat or a dog, all right? But you don't know, all right? And I don't know if I've ever tried to mate a cat and a dog together, and I don't even know what you would call that. A what? A cog? And by judging by the faces you're all making, I don't think you. I don't think you want to. I don't think you want to have them try that anyway. All right. But what is it? Isn't it? Isn't the uh, like a What's a horse? Is it like a horse and a donkey? Yeah. It's a mule. There you go. So, I mean, sometimes, you know, things mate, and I don't know if they're naturally meant to mate or not. Of course, then again, sometimes you see people, and they've mated, and you wonder whether they were actually meant to mate or not. So, you never know. Maybe your turtle will try to mate with a fish sometime. You just never know. That'd be weird, but you never know. All right, bottom of page 163, final methods. Most methods in a class can be overridden, but if you put the word final before the name of a method, then it cannot be overridden. If you put the name final in a class name, so if that had said final class, whatever, then the class cannot be extended. What most books and most authors and most people will tell you that unless you've got a really, really, really good reason to do that, don't ever use final for method names or class names. Because what you're doing is you're making them leaf, L-E-A-F. They're leaf nodes. They don't go any further. They stop right there. All right, it's like saying, it, it's funny with my family, we have, I've got three daughters. My, uh, my brother's, one brother's got two daughters. My oldest brother never married. My sister married late, but before she did, um, my old, my one of my other older brothers, he had four kids, and the first was a son. And the first thing he said when he when he showed, well, at least ke I'm keeping on the family name. All right. A lot of other Scots so, that I'm related to, so I don't think that that was really an issue. But to him, evidently, it was. All right. And again, I just want to make sure you realize that that where they have Rob in here, since Rob is of type pet, you should never do that. Technically. If you look up on the screen here, what the author should have done here, and he shows something like this later, but technically, if you're writing a pet class, okay, all of that should be an abstract class. Did you hear what I said? That means you can never create an instance of that class. You can have abstract methods in, I, in abstract classes and non-abstract methods. But if you would have made pet there, if that would have said ab abstract class pet, then you wouldn't have been able to do this. Rob would have had to have been a cat or a dog. That would have been a much better way to write the program. But I think he's trying to show you that it can be done that way. Not that it should be, but that it can be done that way. All right. It says here in this tip that's at the bottom of page 164, the author says, overriding a method in such a way that it also takes a different number of arguments than the original is referred to as overloading a method. This can be accomplished in PHP, but not as easy as overriding one. Remember, we talked about this in Java, too. What we are talking about right now is overriding the method. Overloading it is when you take it and give it a different number of parameters. All right? And we'll, we'll get to that in a bit. All right. So he gives you this picture here. And I'm hoping by now the picture that you see here on 165, that makes sense to everyone. 
In other words, private is the smallest that there is. And if you want to give it more access, you go to protected. And if you want the most access, you give it public. Public means anybody can use it, whether it's in the class or outside of the class. Protected means the class can use it, and any classes that extend that class can use it. And private means it can only be used directly in that class. Again, we've talked about this stuff before. So the example that he gives in here, this is me speaking, I find really confusing. All right. He does mention that if you are working in UML, remember that unified modeling language, if you put plus before something, that means public. If you put minus before something, it means private. And if you put a pound sign or a hash sign between it, before it rather, it means protected. All right. But he gives you this example, and I don't really want to go through it. I will run it for you. Okay, so let me run it. And it's uh, visibility. And he basically what he says is if something is public, everybody can modify it. Anybody can modify it. All right? If something is protected, it can be modified by that class or a class that extends it, but if you attempt to modify it right, by something that doesn't extend it, you're going to get an error message. It's a visibility message. All right? And that's what he talks about in there. Again, I found the example, although I understood it, it was a little bit convoluted in the way he wrote it, I thought at least. So I'm not going to go over it any more than that. I'm just going to jump ahead to page 172. This is a little bit different. Please look at this. Kind of gets back, Mike, to what Mike L. What to what you asked before. It says OOP has some of its own operators. We've already seen this one, which you use objects to call to access their members, either um, the member of a uh, you know one of its properties or one of its methods. Another one is this these scope resolution operator. There are other languages that use this. It's two colons. It's used to access members through classes, not objects. What? All right. What that means is if you don't want to create the object, sometimes you can call the method directly from the class name as opposed to from an object name. So it's the name of the class followed by colon colon followed by the name of the method. And there's nothing wrong with doing this. In fact, most classes, or most, I should say, most programming language in one form or another do support this. All right? And with some of them, they do use the double colon. So it says this, there's two places that this construct is used. Within classes, to avoid confusion when inherited methods have the same attributes and methods. Outside of classes, to access members without first creating objects. So, if you take a look at it, here's, here's an example. Okay? It says, to refer to a member of a parent class, use the scope resolution operator with the keyword parent. This is where it gets a little bit funky in here. There's all sorts of reading and stuff that you can do online that, that, that gives you suggestions on how you should create things when you work object-oriented. The biggest problem that most people make, when, whether it's an object-oriented design or any other kind of design, is typically designing isn't always a whole heck of a lot of fun. You're sitting there with a group of people, and you're trying to get a group of people to agree on something. It's much easier, especially if you're a programmer, to be locked in a room by yourself and just try to do stuff. And then when you get done, open up the door and show people what you've done. That's not how, always, how, always how it works, though. In fact, that's one of the reasons that a lot of times, rather than just having programmers, places will have programmer analysts. Because it's much easier when you have an analyst, not always, but typically, people who are analysts or programmer analysts maybe have better verbal communication skills. All right, now, that doesn't mean that if you're a programmer, you've got bad communication skills. I'm not trying to say that. All right, but a lot of times, if you're a programmer analyst, for lack of better words, you really know how to play the game. I was a programmer analyst 
um, when, when I was at Woodward Governor. And I worked with a guy, I can't remember his last name, but I remember his first name was Dean. All right? And he was a really good guy. But where I was a programmer analyst, and that was my title, so that was his title too, he wasn't a programmer analyst, though. He was an analyst programmer. In other words, I did more programming and very little analysis. He did more analysis and very little programming. And we'd be in meetings, and I'd have a tendency to start saying something. Oh, yeah, we could. And he'd be like, he'd be just like, grab my arm. Like, Don't agree to anything. Because he was smart. He'd been there a while. He'd gone through it. He understood the process. He knew that if I agreed to do something, even if it was undoable, somebody would try to hold me to that. A lot of times I'd start speaking, and he'd go, you know what, let, let, me, let me just finish with Jeff's thought there. And he'd say, what you say makes sense, and what we'll do is we'll explore it further. And after doing that a couple of times, I kind of learned basically to shut my mouth and let him talk, because it usually meant less work. Right? So it says, for the most part, you'll use the scope res resolution operator to access overridden methods. So this is the way you do it in here. It's not the, the, the super. You do it like this. Does that make sense? It's just that the syntax is different. That's all. You're doing the same kind of thing. So it says, modify the pet constructor so that an animal immediately sleeps. All right, notice in here, sleep is inside of, it's been declared inside of the pet class. So you're already in that. So you, you're already in the class you want to call it from. You can't just say sleep. You've got to say self, colon, colon, sleep. All right, so this is another language that uses, you know, this is a language at least that uses both self and parent and this. Most languages that we've worked with use one or maybe two of them. PHP uses all three. All right, so then they come in with pet three. And they want to make sure that when you do that, you notice immediately when they create one, they're sleeping right away. That's all that they're saying. So they put that into, basically they set that up so that in the constructor of each one of these, whoops, that's got to go up here. So if I bring up pets three, all right, self-sleep, notice, then we can call parent methods. There's parent play. So we've got our own function called play, but what we're saying in there is, you know what? Let's call the parent first. What does that do? Parent play. So we've got to come up here and find that. Okay. He's playing. He's climbing. Okay. And if we look at the output, playing, fetching, playing, climbing. Now, again, depending on how you wrote this, there may or may not be a reason to do this, right? depending on how this class was designed to begin with. But it's a good example in that it shows both self and it shows parent. All right. Anybody remember what static means? couldn't have said pet dot, that this is the way it's set up here. I don't believe it'll work in this language. I don't believe so. No, I believe because these are keywords and that's what it means. And you need a parent or you need a self or you need whatever. You know, yes, you need something. Yes. To my knowledge, that's correct. If you remember, and this is an example similar to one I've given you before, static typically means one that's shared. Okay, And I gave you an example. I talked to you about this a long time ago. But years ago, I used to use a book for Java. And I remember it because it had a mouse on the cover. But I couldn't tell you who the publisher was or you know what the book was. It wasn't Ditel. It was some off-publisher. But what, what the publisher did in the first, in fact, most of the book, they created a simple GUI almost right away. 
and the GUI had two buttons on it. And the button said grow and shrink. Okay? And every time, every time you would create, um, when you started, you had a little dot on the screen, and it meant it was supposed to be a balloon. And every time you click the grow button, it got 10 pixels bigger. And every time you click the, the uh, shrink button, it got 10 pixels smaller. Does that make sense? Then later on, they added another button. And when you click that, that sit next button, it, it was like add another balloon button. So instead of having one, you'd have two. Make sense? All right. But the idea was you'd have a, a counter in there that would always tell you how many balloons you had. You would make that counter static because all of them were sharing it. If I made 10 balloons, I want one counter with a value of 10. I don't want 10 different counters, one for each balloon with a value of one, because that wouldn't make sense. And they're talking about the same kind of thing here. All right. Now, when you work with a static function, so if I make this function right here, if I make n static and I call it three times, it's going to echo one, two, three. If, if I leave this word off, this should make sense to all of you from stuff we've gone over in the past. With the word static in there, that's our output. If I leave the word static off, what's my output? One, one, one. Okay. Now, notice this, because this is different. When you work with classes in PHP and you create constants, anybody remember from last semester? When we created a constant last semester in non non-object-oriented PHP, what word, what keyword did we use for a constant? Anybody remember? Define. But when you're working in, uh, in object-oriented PHP, you can actually use const like you use with other languages. I don't believe it works in non-object-oriented PHP. You can try it. So they try to kind of put all this together here on starting on page 178, 178, 179, and 180. All right. So what they do when you run the program, let me run it, and then we'll come back and kind of sort of decompose it a little bit. With the last one, it's, yeah, that's it. So it creates a dog. And it says you now have one pet. You create a cat. You now have two pets. You create a ferret. You now have three pets. All right. One of them dies. You now have two pets. You add another one, you have three pets. You get the idea. They're using a static count in there. Okay? Now, if you were a breeder, if you were a breeder, you might have a class called pet that had a count so you knew exactly how many dogs, let's say, you had. You know, I have a total of 50 dogs. But I also might have individual counts for each type of dog. You understand what I'm saying? So you'd have a class called dog maybe. Then I would have a subclass that would maybe be called German Shepherd and another one that might be called Beagle and another one that might be called Re Golden Retriever, etc. So I might have one overall count that was static that would be a count of all my dogs. Then for each of the, inher uh, of the child classes, they might have their own counts also. Does, that, does the concept make sense? There's a lot of ways it could be done. What I'm saying is, if you look at his example in here, okay, he's keeping it simple, and he's creating a dog and a cat and a ferret and a pygmy marmoset, I guess. But the point is, all I'm trying to tell you is, he's having, in this case, he's having one counter for everything, which is fine. But if I wanted individual counts, again, I, you wouldn't do that for a human, for just a regular person, but for a breeder, you might do that, where I, if I was breeding whatever it would happen to be, dogs, cats, horses, I might want counts of each of my individual types. And those could be static as well inside of the child class. That's all I'm trying, that, that's all I'm trying to get across. What, what you said, you're, you're not right or wrong. Again, it's, you, what you're starting to think about, though, is the fact that different people end up implementing this stuff differently. You know, it's, it's the same, I've, I've used this example, you heard me say this first semester. You, know, you come in here one day, and let's imagine I'm teaching art. All right, that's a hell of a concept. But, all right, you imagine that I'm teaching art. You come in here the first day, and up on here I've got, I, I, there, there's, there's just a little mantle. And up on the mantle I put a bowl of fruit. 
and whether it's a sketch pad or a paints or whatever, I say, now, I want you to create that fruit. All right. Mark might look at it and see a bunch of grapes, and that might be the biggest thing that he shows. Teresa might say, no, everything's got to be symmetrical. It's got to be the exact same size it is in here. And neither one of them's wrong, right? It's just the way that they both perceive them. In much the same way, when you're a programmer, no two people are going to perceive even as the same set of requirements in the exact same way. All right, so we've got that static count inside a pet is what I'm trying to get across to you. That's what he mentions it. Destruct, notice what he's doing. So each time a pet dies or you give him away or runs away or whatever, you want to take your count, okay, and you want to decrement it by one. Notice it's self-count because that's inside of the pet class. All right. And really, I mean, in some ways, it's kind of a dumb example that he uses. But in some ways, this is a really good program because it really does show you simple program with simple output but it shows you what's going on. And if you take the time to try to follow exactly what's going on in here, again, you may or may not agree with what I'm saying, but it really does make sense. And then finally, for next class, now we're going to go into the next class, abstract classes and methods, interfaces, and then this stuff Traits especially, traits and type hinting are pretty much unique to this language. Namespaces you've seen in other languages. I will tell you, when we do the, the when I go through the examples next time, you're going to have a file that depends on a file that depends on a file. You understand what I'm saying? So if you run some of these programs that are in Chapter 6, I haven't put it out there yet because I'm still working on it myself, but what I'm telling you is for, for, oops, for Chapter 6, so if I change this to 6, These are what we're going to be looking at. But notice, for example, if I run rectangle, I get an error. All right, because that's not the file you're supposed to be running. You're supposed to be running not that one either. It's I think it's one. Yeah. All right. So with some of these in chapter six, if you try to run them, you're going to get an error message. In fact, I think that one gives you an error message. All right. So that's really all that I had. So we will pick it up on Thursday going over chapter 6 and again <clears throat> next week we'll go over 7 and 8 the following week and it may take two weeks I don't know we're going to go over chapter 9 all right and then we're going to start working on a project as a class all right that's all that I have